Hi, welcome back to educator.com. This is the lesson on articulations, also known as joints. We're going to call joints either of these three terms based on how they move or if they don't move. The first one, synarthrosis, that's singular. So synarthroses would be those joints that are completely immovable. Sometimes when you're in utero uh, as a developing baby, you might have slight movement because they're still forming and there's still a little bit of flexibility, but by the time you're born, they're fused. Sometimes it takes you getting to uh, early adulthood by the time they're completely fused. So synarthrosis, completely immovable joint. An amphiarthrosis is kind of the middle ground. That's one of those joints that is slightly movable in certain circumstances, but not as movable as something like this. And finally, the diarthrosis, or more commonly known as synovial joints, those are the ones that are freely movable. And there's a wide variety of movements depending on what particular joint you're talking about in the body. But we'll get to those a little bit later. So we're going to start off with those uh, synarthroses, the completely immovable joints. The first one is sutures. And sutures are most obvious in the skull. Here's an image of a baby's head. And if you could see through the baby's skin, you would see that the surface of their skull has this appearance with the sutures um, you know, connecting all those different cranial bones. And as we mentioned before in the skeletal system lessons, you've got fontanelles. This is one of the more prominent ones, the anterior fontanelle. Uh, there's another little fontanelle here. Those are those soft spots. And one day those will be completely gone because, or they're supposed to be gone because those bones of the cranial uh, section of the skull are supposed to completely fuse. And you have those fontanelles for a couple different reasons, so that the baby can have a little bit of wiggle room when it's coming out through the birth canal, and also to accommodate that massive amount of brain growth that happens uh, in the first couple years of life. So sutures, not just in the skull, uh, they're found all throughout the body, but this is one of the classic places we would see sutures. Uh, a gumphosis, uh, the classic example for a gumphosis, and that's singular, so gumphoses would be found here. The way that all your teeth connect to the mandible and to the maxillae, uh, that connection that's not supposed to be movable is known as a gumphosis. Of course, you lose your baby teeth, but once those adult teeth come in, not supposed to be moving those. If you do have a movable uh, adult tooth, you've got a problem. Uh, a synchondrosis. Uh, synchondrosis, there's a couple different examples. It's another completely immovable joint. If you look at how rib pair one connects to the manubrium just posterior to uh, the clavicles, that's not supposed to be movable. Yes, the ribs that are more inferior, as you inhale and exhale, those costal cartilages are helping to uh, adjust that. But up at the top here, the way that rib pair one connects to the top of the sternum, not supposed to be movable. Uh, also, when you look at uh, the epiphyseal plates, for instance, here's a leg bone. This is a crude drawing of the tibia. This section, as you remember from the other lessons, if you saw them, this would be called the diaphysis and then this section here and this section here are known as the epiphyses or each one's an epiphysis the way that i keep that straight is i imagine uh, a circle here and i think of that shaft of the tibia or of the femur of whatever other long bone that's kind of like the diameter of the circle so diameter diaphysis and epi can mean like above or outside on the uh, exterior portion. So the epiphysis and epiphysis here, both of them are outside of the circle. But I'm digressing a little bit. The epiphyseal plates, you would find this uh, band of, of soft bone or cartilage as the bone develops, as it grows, and as it hardens. The epiph epip epiphyseal plates are going to eventually get to their maximum distance from each other. So epiphyseal plates up here, epiphyseal plate down here. And once the bone is fully grown, it's stopped. So you can think of that finalized epiphyseal plate that's no longer moving as being another example of a connection between one part of a bone, the epiphysis, and the other part of the bone, the diaphysis, that's not supposed to be movable anymore. 
And uh, finally, a synostosis is when you have, let's say, this bone and this bone, the two sides of the frontal bone fusing. In an adult, you would no longer see that suture. Uh, it's not obvious. When you look at a frontal bone, that suture is gone. Uh, so this fuses very early on, and you could call that a synostosis. The other sutures that are more visible in an adult, slightly different. Now these are the slightly movable joints, the amphiarthroses. Uh, a syndesmosis, a syndesmosis is actually uh, pictured right here. Down on the distal end of how the tibia and the fibula connect, these ligaments right here provide a syndesmosis. Now, depending on how you move your feet and the lower parts of your legs, there might be some slight movement there, uh, but not very much, not as much as you have in this section of the body. And a symphysis or symphysis would be when we look at those cartilaginous pads that are between uh, the vertebrae. So let's say uh, here would be T1 and here would be T2, the top two vertebrae of the thoracic curvature. This cartilaginous pad and how it connects to those bones, those are symphyses. So yes, there is slight movement. Um, it's ever so slight movements with each individual pad and articulating bone that lead to the huge movements you can see when somebody does move their back around. So those are amphiarthrosis, slight movements uh, accommodated there. And the one that we're going to spend the most time on and the most interesting is the synovial joints, the ones that are freely movable, uh, the ones that are more obvious to us. So here are some of the, the classic parts you would see in a, in a connection between two bones at this kind of joint. Articular cartilage. So remember, these are called articulations when bones are moving with respect to one another at this connection. So cartilage, soft bone, in that connection is important. So this blue here, light blue, that's the articular cartilage. And if you, let's say, jump off of a high elevation, um, those bones could slightly touch each other or bash into each other. If there wasn't that cushioning there, you could have some more long-term damage over time. But having that cartilage as a cushioning, as a, uh, a, a protection inside of there, very important. So the average synovial joint has that cartilage on the exterior of the two bones that are connected at the joint. The joint capsule uh, tends to be ligaments. So ligaments is that connective tissue fiber that connects bone to bone. So we can see on the outside of this, you've got these fibers connecting the bone on the top, the superior bone, to the inferior bone. Now this is a cross section like we're looking inside of the joint. So oftentimes you're going to also have this joint capsule continuing on the anterior portion and the posterior portion, like in the knee, which we're going to look at more up close. There's a lot in that joint capsule. The synovial membrane is what you see here in red. So the synovial membrane right here, it's the membrane that's lining this interior joint capsule. adjacent to the articular cartilage. And the next term, bursae, that's plural. A bursa is a fluid-filled joint capsule that's lined by that synovial membrane. Uh, bursae are important for many reasons. Number one, lubrication. That helps with moving the joint. Uh, distribution of nutrients is also important. So those are classically found in synovial joints. Uh, you have multiple bursae in the knee. You've got a bursa here. You've got uh, bursae all over the place. And one of these things, uh, or one of the uh, disorders that can happen associated with that is bursitis. And we'll cover that a little bit more uh, later in this lesson. Also, spongy compact bone. Spongy versus compact. You're gonna see mostly spongy bone because as we said, earlier in the bones lessons, it's more common, especially on long bones, to have that spongy bone at the uh, epiphyses and you have slightly more of that compact bone if you go further down. So further down, if we were to continue this drawing, you would see the end of that spongy bone and here's the medullary cavity. 
And these parts here and here, yes, you would see more compact bone. And actually this joint capsule can continue further on down here. And then the periosteum. The periosteum is a little ways away from this drawing, but that is the exterior, um, the more superficial part, especially in the diaphysis. So right here, the edge of this, you would see the periosteum. So those are the main parts of the synovial joint. When it comes to different kinds of movements, uh, there are opposite movements. The most classic one is flexion and extension. So whether it's uh, the lower part of the leg, that kicking motion, extending and flexing, it's also here. Same basic idea. This would be flexion, this would be extension. Flexion, extension. When it comes to abduction and adduction, a little bit different. Abduction and adduction, uh, there are machines in the gym that correspond to these terms. The way I remember it is um, it's with the arms and legs, or you could also talk about the fingers doing it. But abduction is this. So I'm doing an, an abducting. When I lift up my arm like this or lift it up, I'm abducting. And this is adduction, adducting. I think of it as adding my arms together. So now I've added them together. That is adduction. When I go like this, that's abduction. And it's the same thing with the legs. There's that machine at the gym. You, you can't see my legs right now, but you, you put your legs in almost what are like um, stirrups. And if you do the exercise where you're uh, lifting the weight to bring your legs together, that's an adduction machine. If you're doing it where pulling your legs apart is lifting up the weight, uh, that's the, uh, the opposite. That would be the abduction. And also you could say, oh, I'm abducting my fingers. I'm adducting my fingers. Supination and pronation. So this uh, really corresponds uh, mostly to the hands and feet. So if I were to go like this, I'm pronating. This is supinating. Pronating, supinating. So now picture that my hands are my feet. My feet used to pronate when I was very young. My pediatrician told my mom that my feet pronated. So let's say your feet are supposed to sit like this when you're walking in your shoes. My feet were ever so slightly inwards when I would walk. And part of it is I have flat feet. I don't have a substantial arch in my foot. So that contributed to it. But my mom noticed that something was up because on the soles of my shoes, the uh, more medial side, the, the inner part would be worn away more than the outer or lateral part of the sole. Um, so she asked the doctor, what's the, what's the reason why this is happening? He said, well, your son pronates. So I had to kind of train myself to slightly do supination a little bit more and, and kind of walk a little bit more on the outsides of my feet. And, and now I walk like I'm supposed to, so I, I don't have that problem anymore. Uh, but somebody who's, who's doing this with their feet is pronating. Someone who's doing this is supinating. Depression and elevation. Uh, something with your shoulders like this. Elevation, depression. Elevation, depression. Elevation, depression. You do a little dance. Uh, retraction and protraction, uh, that could be something as simple as this. Protraction, retraction. Protraction, retraction. Protraction, retraction. Um, very unique joint movement. And finally, circumduction. You could do that with the leg or the arm. Uh, this doesn't really have an opposite because it's just two different directions of circumduction. I am circumducting and I am still circumducting. So there you go. Those are the uh, basic synovial joint movements. There are slightly more. You could get really specific with other terms, but these are the main ones. We can also look at synovial joint types according to what kinds of those movements that we just went over that they do. So hinge joints. Hinge joints tend to be in that flexion extension group. Uh, so a hinge joint, uh, you could call this a hinge joint. Um, there's, there's slightly other movements that you could do, uh, but I've heard people call this a hinge joint. Um, the way that this happens, it's kind of like a hinge on a door, right? You can close the door, open the door, close the door, open the door uh, with each of these joints. Um, if you're doing this, it's actually rooted down here. Uh, the movement that's permitted with your fingers is the flexion extension, flexion extension. Also, you could say that the jaw is, is a, is a hinge joint. Extension, flexion. Um, pivot joints, a classic one would be the neck. It's, it's usually rotating back and forth. 
a little bit different than the uh, extension flexion idea. So here's a pivot joint, the way that I am pivoting my axis and atlas. Those are um, C1 and C2 at the top of the, the vertebral column. Uh, gliding joints. Um, I could say that a gliding joint would be the way that uh, part of my uh, pectoral girdle works. So the way that the clavicle glides just a little bit on, on the surface of the manubrium and sternum, uh, it's, it's different than the ones we went, went over so far. Uh, think of gliding as being uh, kind of this action. This would be the, the surface of um, uh, the sternum or the manubrium, and there's a slight gliding that's accommodated when this bone is moving with respect to the other. So gliding joint could be there. Uh, ellipsoid. Uh, an ellipsoid joint is kind of like how the the wrist bones move with respect uh, to the forearm bones, the ulna and radius. A um, little bit different uh, than gliding. Think of it as being uh, like a little bit of a well and kind of moving like this with respect to the well. Uh, that would be an ellipsoid joint. So the way that that these wrist bones or carpals move with respect to the forearm bones. A saddle joint, you could think that the thumb is a little bit different than what's going on here. The way that this uh, particular metacarpal, metacarpal number one, uh, fits with uh, the radius here, that is a saddle joint. And it's kind of like, it's slightly different from ellipsoid because think of the shape of a saddle, a little bit different than just a simple well. A saddle, has that classic look, and then you've got something in the saddle. So think of this bone sitting in here, that's the saddle, and my thumb is, is a little cowboy in the saddle. So here's a saddle joint, the way that these two come together. And finally, ball and socket, that's one of the classic ones you hear about. Uh, ball and socket up here, the way that the head of the humerus fits into the rotator cuff, You've got a ball and you've got a socket. And then the other one down here at the hip, uh, your thigh bone or femur has a head on it and it fits into this bony well of the uh, coxae or pelvic bones called the acetabulum. And that allows something like circumduction, a very smooth circular motion in many different directions. That's your ball and socket. The knee joint is the most complex joint in the human body of all the synovial joints. A uh, lot going on here. I'm not going to be able to cover every single part, but uh, we're going to cover a lot of the main ones. So you've got all the typical synovial joint parts. You've got um, your synovial membrane, the, the bursae, you've got the joint capsule. We're seeing only part of the joint capsule here because a lot of the exterior stuff has been removed. This is uh, one of those classic pictures from Gray's Anatomy. We have a posterior view of what looks to be the left knee because I know that since the fibula is more lateral, uh, we're looking at the back of, uh, of the left knee. The first one I want to mention is what's called a meniscus, and this is plural, menisci. One of the definitions of meniscus is if we look at a graduated cylinder and you're trying to measure uh, the water level in it, you may have heard in, in a basic science class that water kind of wants to climb up the sides of the container and that can fool you in terms of how much water is in there. So you're supposed to look at the bottom of the meniscus uh, to see you know, what the actual measurement in milliliters is or what have you. The shape that that little water line has is similar to the meniscus we're talking about in the knee. If you were to take the tibia out of this and look down on it, down on top of the tibia from a superior view, let's say here's the top of the tibia, you would see a lateral meniscus here, and you would see the medial meniscus here. It's a cushiony cartilaginous pad um, that helps gives some, some shock absorption to the knee. And if you looked at the side of this, so a side view of this meniscus, it would look kind of like this. Nice little shock absorber. So those are the menisci. 
Uh, the ACL, you hear about that a lot. The anterior cruciate ligament, ACL. So anterior, remember that means towards the front of the body. Cruciate comes from uh, crossing, la cruz, uh, cross. And the reason why they have that term is because the ACL and the PCL, one goes like this and the other one goes like this. So it's like they're crossing over one another. And from this view, you could see that the ACL is labeled right there. Uh, that's this particular ligament. So it connects on the back side of the femur and comes down in the front and connects to the top front of the tibia. So that's why it's anterior. It's like it's coming out that way. And the PCL uh, comes back this way. You can see that the PCL, uh, posterior cruciate ligament, connects at the back of the tibia and comes up top to connect to the femur. So those do cross each other. There's also the TCL, uh, the FCL. There's a lot of different ligaments in here. Another one I want to mention is if we looked at the front of this knee joint, the patella is shaped like this. And connecting the patella to the front of the tibia, the top portion of it, you've got the patellar ligament. And actually, there's another bursa in front of the patella, a very tiny little fluid sac uh, there. And then on the top of the patella, you've got a tendon. Tendons are different from ligaments in the fact that they connect muscle to bone. Ligaments is bone to bone. But this particular tendon connecting the patella connects to uh, the, the quadriceps, connects to these muscles that are right in front of the, uh, the femur, the thigh bone. Joint disorders and conditions. Uh, classic one, arthritis. You hear about arthritis a lot. It affects millions of Americans. Osteoarthritis usually happens the older you get, the more severe it gets in general. So osteoarthritis is that wear and tear, um, doing a lot over many years, um, whether it was a lot of physical activity, uh, hard work, you know, manual labor, those things can contribute to osteoarthritis. And there are genetic factors uh, that can impact those things. So osteoarthritis uh, is just happens over time. Um, there are medications that can help with that in terms of dealing with the pain. Um, there are also certain injections that research has shown can add a little bit of that cartilage back to the scenario um, of course, dietary stuff is very important, getting calcium in your diet, getting vitamin D in your diet, having a healthy diet over the long run is going to minimize the chances of getting osteoarthritis. So that's more from wear and tear, generally. Rheumatoid arthritis, different cause. Uh, rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis affects about 0.5 to 1% of the American population. That's usually from your immune system attacking your joints. And we're not sure as to what are all the causes of that, uh, but it's a terrible disease. There's no cure for it. There are medications that can help deal with it, um, make it so that it's not happening quite as rapidly. But that is what's called an autoimmune disorder. That's not as common as osteoarthritis. Bunions. Bunions, that is the most classic version of bursitis, which I'll tell you more about in a sec. A bunion uh, tends to happen at that connection between um, the uh, metatarsal of the big toe and that first um, phalanx, uh, that um, um, proximal phalanx. So it looks like when you look at the big toe that you have a big, here's the nail of the big toe, you've got a big kind of jutting out, a big uh, projection coming out. One of the ways it can happen is wearing confining shoes like high heels over many, many years. That's one of the ways that you could stress out the joint, which leads to inflammation over time or swelling. And it can be something that gets very hard and gets uh, very painful. There are surgeries that can remove uh, the bunion. But yeah, um, wearing comfortable shoes and, and making sure you have proper footwear is going to help um, minimize the chances of getting a bunion over time. Bursitis, anytime you have irritation of the bursae in a joint cavity or, or joint capsule, you can get bursitis. Uh, it's not always um, just irritation from physical activity. I mean, that is a very common way you can get it. It also could be from an infection. 
if you get a bacteria or virus inside the bursae negatively affecting what's going on in there, that can lead to that, that painful uh, irritation in the joint. There are lots of nicknames for different kinds of bursitis. Um, I've heard tennis elbow. I've even heard uh, student's elbow. So if you're sitting at your computer watching this presentation like this, and you do that a lot, you could be putting a little too much strain on the, the bursae inside of that elbow joint. Uh, that could lead to bursitis. Now everyone's like this. Okay. Uh, dislocations. Uh, the first dislocation that came to mind when I thought of this, uh, I thought of shoulder dislocations. That's probably one of the more common ones. So if that head of the humerus comes out of the rotator cuff and how it's supposed to fit around it very nicely, that can obviously be very painful and it's going to minimize uh, the movements you can make with it. Sometimes they can easily be popped back into place. Usually if you've had a dislocation once, it's more likely you could get one again in the future or multiple ones. Sometimes surgery is needed uh, to properly put a bone back where it's supposed to be in its articulation. And last, hyperextension. So a hyperextension, if you think about extending this particular joint or extending your lower leg, it has a maximum that it's supposed to go to. So here I'm at about 180 degrees. If I go more like 185, 190, 200, I could actually uh, damage the joint. It's not necessarily permanent damage, uh, but hyperextensions, sometimes they just they heal on their own with, with some rest and not using it, that particular joint. Sometimes surgery is required to properly fix a hyperextension. Thanks for watching educator.com.